welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm Emily Ringer with Polar Bears International and I'm excited to be here for another conservation happy hour with all of you. And this, this is a very special, special conservation happy hour for us because we are celebrating uh, Dr. Stephen Amstrup's career, uh, not just as a star of a silent movie, but as a, a world-renowned polar bear scientist. And we are also welcoming uh, some really exciting new faces onto our staff. So I, uh, I will leave the formal introductions to Krista, but before we get going, uh, one of the big goals of, of doing this and, and hosting this webinar is so that all of you who are so connected to this work get an opportunity to learn about all of uh, the faces that you see on this screen and also to ask some of your questions. So I would ask now that you locate the Q&A feature on your Zoom webinar window. So it's probably going to be in the bottom toolbar. It will say Q&A with overlapping speech bubbles. And any questions that you have throughout this webinar, just type them in there. I will be monitoring those questions and finding a place to feed them in. And if we don't get to them while, while the panelists are presenting, we will definitely get to them at the end. And then one final reminder that we are recording this webinar so that everyone knows we'll send it out afterwards uh, to those that weren't able to join or if you wanna watch again or share with friends or family, you're more than welcome to. And with that, I will pass it on to Krista Wright, our executive director. Well, thank you, Emily, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, yes, we're here to celebrate, um, even though we are going to be very sad to lose Steve. It's also a celebration as we grow our team and and we're hoping we can keep Steve, you know, connected to Polar Bears International, but just not on a daily basis. But um, for those of you who do not know Steve, Steve has been our chief scientist um, for well over a decade, and he is soon retiring. Um, and I'm going to introduce a few other people with us today, and then you will learn quite a bit about them and their background as we proceed through this conservation happy hour. So um, also with us today is Dr. John Whiteman. Uh, John is gonna serve as the chief research scientist for Polar Bears International. And he is also an assistant professor, professor of biology at Old Dominion University. Um, and then we also have Flavio Lerner. He is our chief climate scientist, and he is also an assistant professor in earth and atmospheric science at Cornell University. So we are very lucky to have both of them. And I also want to thank their respective universities because the universities, um, both of their universities are supporting um, them spending some time with Polar Bears International as our chief science team. And although we're here today to learn more about this significant transition, um, I don't wanna overlook um, that we have another new member um, joining our staff. And some of you might know Amy Cutting because she has been um, around Polar Bears International for almost two decades. Um, Amy was formerly uh, with the Oregon Zoo and she has been working on the front lines with um, the animal care team for her whole entire career. So she brings so much to the table. Um, she's also, um, you know, as I had mentioned before, had been an, uh, an advisor to Polar Bears International. So many people in her, our community already know Amy really well. And I'm thinking a lot of you today joining us also know Amy. And Amy's gonna be a big part of this transition as well, because Steve has extremely big shoes to fill. And we've had to bring many people on the team to help us, you know, kind of support us in that transition. Um, before we hand it over to Steve, because Steve's going to tell you a little bit more about his retirement and how we came to making the decisions of his replacements, um, I wanted to first thank Steve for his um, leadership and dedication to Polar Bears and to Polar Bears International specifically um, over the last 12 years since he had his first retirement when he retired from the USGS. So um, Steve's been a huge part of growing the organization into what it is today, and that we're even 
able to attract the talent that we've have um, for his replacement. Um, so a few of um, Steve's remarkable accomplishments, you know, were not achieved at PBI. They were actually achieved um, throughout his career. And even though the list is quite remarkable, um, it actually is even getting longer. I think he'll have a few things to add to the list before he officially retires um, as he's continued to work hard on pushing a lot of things forward. But a few most notable accomplishments, um, for those of you who did not know some of these things, for some of you, this is maybe things that you already knew, but um, Steve was the first person to radio collar a polar bear. And this happened in the 80s when he was at the USGS. Um, and this information has been extremely valuable. Um, it verified that polar bears have tremendous movements and extensive home ranges. And along with demonstrating those movements, there were also this idea of identifying subpopulations of polar bears. And even though those boundaries might be soft um, and that there would be a lot of movement happening um, between bears and those subpopulations, it, it's helped us learn more about those subpopulations, manage those subpopulations, and maybe look into the future a little bit um, about how things you know, might change over time with um, the declining sea ice. So that's been a very big, significant contribution that still um, is very important to our understanding of polar bears. Um, he also discovered that polar bears in Alaska were denning on pack, pack ice. And although I knew this, I didn't realize that um, that both the Russian and Canadian research teams were, you know, weren't sure that polar bears actually resided in the U.S., um, respectively, Alaska. So um, this helped us helped us to have a greater understanding of bears in Alaska, where they were denning and giving birth to young. So. Um, and then probably one of Steve's most distinguished accomplishments, or at least I think of it as that way, um, because it leads a lot of, you know, it leads to a lot of where we spend some of our time and energy is um, he led the listing of polar bears to the endangered species list as threatened in 2008. So along with his research team, he provided evidence to the Secretary of Interior to list polar bears, and they are the first species ever listed due to human-caused global warming. So, and I think that is still true today. Um, Maybe that's a question for Steve later. <laughs> um, so, um, and beyond his, you know, being recognized throughout his career um, by, you know, people in the polar bear world, Steve has also been recognized many times by people outside the polar bear world. Um, he is the winner of the Indianapolis Prize, which is considered one of the most distinguished um, awards um, given to people working in animal and wildlife conservation. And he also was awarded the Bambi Award in Germany that recognizes excellence um, to those with vision and creativity. And I think even just reflecting back on some of Steve's accomplishments, that is a good, that was a, a, a well-honored award because he has demonstrated vision and creativity, and that hasn't stopped at his tenure with PBI. So, Steve, we can't thank you enough, and we are excited to hear a little bit about your retirement and, and the plans that you've laid forward for PBI. And this really has been, again, Steve, Steve's leadership um, in, in choosing both of our new scientists. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Steve. get myself off of mute here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Krista, for that introduction. I appreciate all the kind words that you've said. You know, I feel really fortunate to have been able to spend now uh, over 42 years working with polar bears, 30 years as a hardcore researcher with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the uh, uh, USGS in Alaska, and now the last uh, 12 years approximately with Polar Bears International. I mean, these are both uh, really great honors for me and I feel really fortunate. You know, when in 1979, when our lab director asked me if I was interested in going to Alaska to uh, study polar bears, uh, there had been a kind of a, a 
polar bear project in Alaska limping along, but it hadn't really been producing anything. And they wanted somebody to go up there who could really get the project going. I said, pick me, pick me. Uh, I mean, what could be uh, more exciting than studying giant white bears roaming around on a surface that looks like the moon? Uh, I just thought this was uh, possibly the ripest plum in the wildlife profession. And I was really feeling fortunate and still feel fortunate to have, uh, have had that uh, opportunity. And uh, I, I, as I said, I feel really fortunate that when I left that research position, uh, that uh, uh, I was able to jump right into Polar Bears International, where I was able to apply a lot of the wisdom that I had gained in 30 years uh, studying polar bears to polar bear conservation. Uh, I think everybody uh, who's listening knows that research isn't conservation, but research should inform conservation. And my main role working with PBI has been to help make sure that that, that uh, is what happened. Uh, we've had some really good times with polar bears and some not so good times. When I uh, first went to Alaska, everything was fun. Everything was new and exciting. I was able to document that polar bears uh, had recovered from excessive harvest that had occurred in the 60s and 70s, um, and uh, that uh, uh, things were really looking good. But uh, by about the 90s, mid 90s or so, things weren't looking so good. And uh, it was uh, interesting to be in that position where I recognized that my timing in coming to the polar bear world was such that I was seeing a great transition and a great uh, messaging opportunity uh, for uh, to deliver a message that in fact wildlife was sending to the human population. And throughout all of this, I really uh, most importantly need to thank my wife, Virginia, uh, for sticking by me in a lot of times that uh, maybe weren't exactly what she uh, uh, kind of expected. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's been great to have her by my side, especially in these last few years when uh, there have been a lot of things that haven't really been going the way of conservation. Uh, so I, I'm really grateful for that as well. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, there's a few things that, uh, that really stick in my mind in my history of, of uh, studying polar bears. And uh, one of them uh, is the dramatic changes in the sea ice that I saw. When I first went to Alaska in 1980, I could stand on the beach in the summertime, the beach of uh, the, the coastline of Northern Alaska, and I could see the sea ice offshore in most of those early years, the sea ice only retreated from the shore a few miles. And uh, uh, by the latter years of my uh, studying there, the ice was hundreds of miles offshore, uh, you know, beyond the curvature of the earth. So you couldn't, you couldn't resolve the ice with the highest powered telescope. And if somebody had told me uh, when I first started that I was gonna see that kind of change, I, uh, I just couldn't have imagined. And of course the impacts on polar bears were pretty profound because my studies, by the time we were seeing these sea ice changes, my studies had shown that polar bears depended on that sea ice near shore all summer long. The early radio telemetry locations were in that near shore continental shelf area. And suddenly uh, in the summertime, that was gone. So this had to be having an important impact on polar bears. And uh, you know we didn't understand exactly what that impact was gonna be at first, but uh, the, the signs came along. We saw progressively fewer big males, which probably meant that those guys weren't getting the nutrition that they had been years before. And we were seeing poor survival of cubs. So I saw some pretty profound changes and uh, in 2007, our laboratory in Alaska was tasked to inform Secretary of Interior Dirk Kempthorne uh, what he should do about a petition, whether or not to list polar bears as a threatened species under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And uh, this uh, ended up being uh, uh, about six months worth of really intense work for our whole research team and an expanded team that we had invited from an international pool of experts to try and come up with the best possible answers. Ultimately, we provided a series of papers 
that informed Secretary of Interior that, you know, uh, we needed to list polar bears as a threatened species. And uh, at the end of our session with, uh, uh, and I gave uh, three personal interviews, which <laughs> these were kind of exciting in and of themselves because uh, a peon like me, a field researcher, usually doesn't get to give personal briefings to the Secretary of Interior. I ended up giving three which were kind of nerve rattling, but the secretary was a, a perfect gentleman and uh, patient and also very interested. And in the end, he listed polar bears as a threatened species in the spring of 2008. So uh, we had uh, come a long ways from the early days when uh, polar bears seemed to be doing really well to times when they weren't uh, doing so well. In 2010, my colleagues and I published a paper uh, showing that we could lose two thirds of the world's bears by the middle of this century if we didn't change our greenhouse gas emissions path. And unfortunately, we really haven't changed that path very much since then. A couple of years ago, we published another paper showing not only that we're still on that dangerous path for polar bears, uh, but uh, that uh, uh, we sort of identified the mechanistic underpinnings of those earlier uh, of those earlier predictions and uh, showed that, you know, we still have time to save them, but time is getting shorter and shorter. So uh, let's see how to uh, how to proceed from here. For several years now, I've been thinking, well, I'm not going to be doing this forever. And uh, you know, I'm 72 years old now, and uh, I'd like to spend a little bit more of my time enjoying the world, not just trying to save it. Uh, and plus, I think that we need some new life uh, in terms of uh, scientific input into Polar Bears International. Uh, you know, I thought about, well, if I leave Polar Bears International, do we get another old guy like me who's retired from some other organization and uh, 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 wants to work for something, you know, for a different organization for a few years. And I thought, you know, what we really could use is some young people who are uh, really making headway in the research environment, but also are keen to see that their research is uh, uh, contributing to conservation. And that's kind of a hard thing to find because if you're a young scientist, you're measured based on your publications. You're measured on your scientific uh, output and not necessarily on the application of that scientific output. So you have to be really dedicated to both to really fit the model that, uh, uh, that I thought was necessary for Polar Bears International. But fortunately, uh, my experiences have led me to two young people who really fit the mold perfectly. And this is uh, Dr. John Whiteman, uh, who is going to be our new uh, chief ecological scientist, and Dr. Flavio Lehner, who is our chief climate scientist. And both of these guys fit the mold that I just described ideally. Uh, in John's case, I first met him, I think it was in around 2007 when he was beginning his PhD program. And he uh, was mounting an ambitious program from the University of Wyoming with uh, uh, tremendous support, including support for, with an icebreaker, which was something that uh, uh, we had never had before. And it allowed him to take a novel approach to look at polar bear nutrition and energetics and learn things that we hadn't ever learned before. And for example, one of the things that was kind of near and dear to me is that uh, uh, for many years, as I'd been watching the ice retreat, I'd been seeing more and more bears spending time on land in the summertime. And I knew a lot of them weren't doing very well, but I always thought that those bears that are going way offshore into the uh, pack ice over the deep polar basin probably weren't feeding either. Uh, there's not very much to eat out there. All the productivity that might occur out there falls down to five or 6,000 feet below the surface. And indeed, uh, one of John's outcomes was that uh, polar bears are not feeding when they're way out in that drifting pack ice. So that was really a profound thing. And I think that that's a good lead for me to pass it on to, uh, uh, to John and uh, hear a little bit more about uh, his background and what he brings to uh, Polar Bears International. So John, take it away. 
Sure thing. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and thanks everybody for being here. Awfully happy to be here. Um, it's really one of the really neat things about me for this in general and to hear about tonight is to hear Steve talk about the arc of his career and how it started off with this real kind of period of discovery and just nailing down some fundamentals about the distribution, population, dynamics, um, those kind of big topics about polar bears. And now how, it, you know, the arc of that was then taking it, taking all that information and ending up in a place where um, all the science really needs to be supporting conservation because climate change has become such an existential threat to the species. And that's really neat because, um, you know, that is around when I started to get involved um, and around when I started my graduate work. And that's exactly where I wanted to start my career. So, you know, it's this uh, symbolic handoff that, um, you know, it, there's a lot of different perspectives on it that line up. Um, to emphasize just how, you know, the, the, the coupling of that, you know, Steve was talking about the listing of bears, um, that they officially became listed after I had uh, accepted my PhD position to start working on polar bears, but before I had actually had my day one. So the status of the species uh, changed in a real meaningful way for me before I could even get started. Um, and one of the things that I would say about this early on in my graduate career, uh, it, it became clear to me that it's, it's really hard to overstate uh, Steve's contribution to the field. To the point where when you're a graduate student and you're writing um, your chapters that will eventually become your papers that you get them published and you have to cite everything that it is everything that you're saying in the paper right that's one of the, the basics of science is anything you say needs to be backed up by somebody else's data or your own data and so when you're writing about polar bears you end up citing Steve a lot <laughs> and so I remember at one point I tried to get it in um, uh, in the early 2000s, Steve wrote a chapter for a book called the Encyclopedia of Wildlife or Encyclopedia of Wild Mammals, something like that. And he wrote the chapter on polar bears in which he kind of summarized the state of knowledge at the time. And I may have tried to get away with just citing that encyclopedia a couple of times because I didn't want to wade through the, his papers and I was, I was called out on it. Um, so back to the, the question though that Steve had kind of set me up with here, and that is, the one of the main focuses of my dissertation and was tackling a question that Steve had long been thinking about. And that was, what is the nutritional status of polar bears during the summer when they follow the sea ice north? As he mentioned, the sea ice used to retreat, especially off the northern coast of Alaska, tens of kilometers. And then by the time we were doing this field work, it was more like hundreds of kilometers. And it was far out of reach um, for helicopters that were land-based. So that meant we needed an icebreaker to go all the way out to the sea ice, carry the helicopters with us, and then go out onto the pack ice and capture and sample the bears. So you can see a picture of the icebreaker there. It was, uh, it was a real adventure and it was, um, it was a pretty profound experience to be able to see their habitat in person. One thing that I would add is that the question of uh, understanding what is polar bear nutritional status during the summer is intertwined with this question of something called walking hibernation, which is something that uh, some of you may have heard about. And the very brief backstory there is in 1983, a uh, human medical biologist got a hold of bear samples and some collaborators at different universities who studied bears, including some blood samples from polar bears in the summer. And they analyzed the blood metabolites and realized that polar bears in summer had a couple of biochemical markers that looked really similar to black bears in winter. And then they also put that together with the knowledge that polar bears hunt from the sea ice. If the sea ice is melted or retreated in the summer, there's not as much hunting for them. Maybe they just go into this version of hibernation during the summer and it was coined walking hibernation. And then like sometimes happens in science, this idea is put forth with a little bit of data and it's a sound hypothesis and it just kind of gets legs. And over the next decades, it ended up being cited as fact. And during the discussions about how polar bears were going to be affected by climate change, one of the ideas that was being put out there was perhaps the loss of sea ice during the summer wouldn't be as much of a problem because they're hibernating anyway. So we needed to figure out what is the nutritional status during the summer and if, uh, if they are food deprived out on the sea ice, are they actually in a hibernation-like state? 
And the short answers are uh, yes, we found out they were food deprived in the summer. We looked at a variety of biochemical analyses in the blood, the same kind of stuff that we would look at for humans to see if they're food deprived. And we found that polar bears were largely going without food when they're out over the deep water. And then the second part of the answer is, if I had to put in one word, no, <laughs> they're not in walking hibernation. There's some confusion, I think, that remains around a couple of the metabolites that aren't doing what we expect them to do during food deprivation. But I think that's another field of research or that's a launching pad for future studies. But in the short term, um, that real critical question of what is their status in the summer? It's not hibernation. They're not like black bears in winter. They are not adaptively fasting to the point where they are physiologically not really going to notice a lack of food in the summer. Um, they're definitely noticing it and they're fasting essentially like you and I would uh, in the summer months. Um, so that's a little bit about me and how I ended up here. Uh, and um, a little bit later, I think we can talk some more about where uh, I'm interested in seeing future research going and communication about the science. Uh, but at the moment, I'll hand it back to Steve and I think he has another introduction to do. Well, thank you. Uh... Thank you, John. That's great. And, and that was a good example of uh, one of the things that I was most impressed with early on with John is that he could explain things in incredibly effective ways to just about any audience. And that's really important if you're going to be applying your research to uh, conservation. And uh, I'm going to take off from there and, and uh, talk about Flavio Lehner. And uh, Flavio also has that same gift of being able to explain things very well. Uh, so after, uh, um, well, uh, about the mm, 2004, 2005 timeframe, when it was really becoming clear that uh, polar bears uh, were uh, uh, victims of this changing climate, that, that the situation facing polar bears was really, does, really dire because of global warming, I spent a lot of time starting to get into the global warming research, uh, uh, climate science research. And in fact, I think in the last decade or so, I probably spent more time reading climate science research than I have biological research because it's so fundamental to uh, uh, the questions that, uh, that we have with regard to a future for polar bears. And uh, uh, one of the things that that led me to was in, uh, uh, 2016, an editor of an upcoming book about marine mammal welfare uh, asked if I would write a chapter on polar bears for the book. And I didn't really want to write another book chapter about polar bears. There had been a number of them out there already, and they could have a slightly different uh, flavor, but uh, uh, I didn't see much new there. But what I counter proposed to the editor was writing a chapter about how uh, the marine environment and marine mammals in general are likely to be affected by an ongoing uh, uh, warming world. And uh, so they said, yeah, that's great. Let's, let's have that. We'll put that right up in the front of the book. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that uh, I had the best uh, information going forward. And I needed somebody to join me in this who really was a du jour climate scientist. And about that same time, Flavio Lehner published a paper looking at how warm, uh, how summer temperatures are likely to change in the future and uh, showed some tremendous graphics illustrating, uh, for example, that uh, if we continued on our current path at that time, that 90% of North America uh, was likely to, uh, or that much of North America was likely to be have a 90% probability of having warmer summers than we'd ever experienced. And I thought, bingo, that's the kind of message that we need to link what's happening with polar bears to what's happening with the rest of us or what's going to happen to the rest of us. And that sort of clever kind of approach to presenting information I thought was really useful. So I contacted Flavio and asked if he'd be interested in helping me with this paper. And fortunately, he was very uh, interested. He jumped on board. We produced what I think still, even though it was a few years ago, uh, is uh, still a very valuable paper. And we followed that up with another paper uh, uh, looking at uh, how the environment is changing in Africa and the impact that that might have on cheetahs. And this was for a book uh, that Laurie Marker was editing on 
cheeta welfare. So here we are connecting the dots between the Arctic and other parts of the world where often more people live and therefore more people have a stake in what's going on. And uh, with those things in mind, I'm, uh, I'm gonna now pass it on to Flavio so he can tell us a little bit more about himself and uh, his, uh, his future with uh, Polar Bears International. Yeah, thanks Steve. Uh, and thanks everybody for, for joining tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, well, on the one hand, join PBI formally, but also yeah, get to interact with, with all of you. Uh, I've volunteered in a way, as, as Steve alluded to, uh, with PBI for a while but I'm really excited to join sort of formally. Um, I can talk a little bit about myself uh, in the next few slides. Um, I just started out here with a picture actually from this summer when we were in Churchill for the beluga whale season. Um, and we talked again about climate change uh, and, and how it impacts uh, yeah, ecosystems, animals in all kinds of seasons, not just winter season. Uh, but one thing that I really liked about that particular trip uh, and really all the interactions with PBI is that uh, no matter how often you think about climate change and think about bears uh, and other ecosystems, there's always something to learn because PBI has this magical power of bringing together uh, amazing people as, as, as again tonight. Uh, and so it's not always just about communicating the science you do, uh, it's also about learning. Uh, and so that, that was definitely one of the things that I'm also excited about. Um, so my, my background is really, uh, as Steve sort of alluded to, um, a hardcore climate scientist in the sense that I really produce these kind of projections of climate change into the future. But um, I do, whenever I get the chance, I try to get into the field uh, to measure things uh, in the real world and not just think about distant futures uh, using computer models. And uh, here's a couple of uh, pictures from my first encounter with polar bears. Uh, way back, uh, like a different haircut in 2009, when I was able to join uh, an oceanographic measurement campaign by yeah by the German Polar uh, Research uh, Institute, uh, also being on an icebreaker in Fram Strait between Greenland uh, and Svalbard. Uh, we were mostly taking measurements, but a couple of times throughout, uh, like polar bears just came up to, to the ship to check out what we were doing. And it was just this profound experience of like uh, being out there uh, doing measurements that you then use to do climate science, but also seeing the animals that are affected by climate change uh, right there in the same environment. Uh, despite despite the, this kind of profound experience, I ended up doing a lot of uh, modeling work rather than observational work, but I, I always had this like desire to link it back to, to what's happening at the smaller scale. Uh, and so over, over the years, I had other opportunities to, to take my climate science and, and, and take it to the field uh, and, and connect it. Uh, so I spent a fair amount of time at the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Colorado and, and took part in uh, measurement campaigns to basically reconstruct the climate over the last thousands of years using tree rings. Here I'm recording tree rings in the Southern Rockies. Uh, and again, the idea there is to get a baseline uh, of what the climate was before humans started to, to change it. Uh, and before we had thermometers, uh, like thermometers only about 150 years back in the best case. And so to get a longer sense, we, we do these paleoclimate reconstructions using tree rings and other sources. Uh, and then once you're in the West and you do climate, uh, climate science, there's no way getting around talking about water. So I spend a fair amount of time trying to connect my research and the research on, on, on uh, rainfall changes, snow changes to what it means uh, for stakeholders on the ground. So we end up talking to yeah, people in the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, water resource managers uh, about what climate change might mean for them. And uh, yeah, if you're lucky, you, you get uh, encounters with bears as well uh, in, in those kind of environments. But yeah, as I mentioned, most of my time I actually spend uh, with computer models, uh, trying to look into the future, trying to understand what's happening both in the Arctic and globally. And then also teaching at Cornell University, which frankly is just another uh, case of where, yes, I'm teaching people, I'm trying to communicate things, but uh, with the smart students and the young people uh, nowadays, it's really also always a learning experience for me. What, what do they care about? What do they think about? What do they know that I don't know yet? So just another sort of side story of, I guess, how, why I'm doing the job I'm doing. Um, 
So to bring it back to some like specific science that uh, I think Steve also sort of alluded to, uh, we published a couple of papers where we looked at sort of an important question from a climate change policy perspective. And that is like, what happens if we cross certain thresholds in the climate system and two sort of like perceived thresholds that have been around uh, uh, in the news you might've heard about are this one and a half and two degree uh, warming uh, targets or, or, or thresholds. So it's like one and a half degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius above what we think the temperature of the earth was before uh, humans started changing the climate. Um, and so for a lot of things, uh, there's not like a, a fundamental difference uh, between one and a half and two degrees, uh, like heat waves get a certain percent more frequent, et cetera. But there are uh, certain aspects of the climate system that kind of like show very different behavior once you, you get to certain temperatures. Um, and so one thing we looked at is, uh, again, sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, what's the probability for sea ice to disappear uh, in summer? Sort of like the September Arctic sea ice minimum. Uh, and we see, like, based on like a whole range of climate model simulations, we see that if we get to a one and a half degree world, there's actually a high chance that, uh, that we retain sea ice uh, in the Arctic even through, through summer uh, to some degree. Um, this is this green line here uh, that stays kind of flat. Um, but then if we get into a world that is two degrees uh, uh, or maybe even above, uh, the probability to have an Arctic uh, being ice free in summer and with that, a much longer period where bears, for example, can, can't hunt on sea ice, um, that probability goes up steeply. Uh, and so there's like a, so, so to say, a world of difference between those two worlds. Uh, but having, being able to quantify this uh, with like, yeah, big calculations is really, uh, important to 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 link this um, to what what climate change means on the ground. There's a couple of other things. Uh, sea level rise also has profoundly different impacts, um, whether we get to one and a half or two degrees. Uh, and so, all of these things are opportunities to connect like this global problem of climate change to uh, specific locations like the Arctic, like yeah, the ecosystem of polar bears, uh, but then also island nations that that might. Uh, go under or not, depending on uh, how much we warm the planet. And so throughout that, I, 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 I strive to, to connect this kind of like hard science numbers to what it actually means on the ground. And PBI was just this perfect or continues to be this perfect uh, organization to, to partner with uh, and, and do that. Um, and so I think I'm only going to say a few more things uh, on, on this and then hand it back. I, the other sort of avenue that I've been engaging in uh, a lot in the last few years are these sort of big reports uh, uh, on climate change put together by hundreds of scientists. Um, like probably the most popular one uh, or the most well-known one is from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC. Uh, we published a big report last year where again, we assessed uh, not just Arctic sea ice, but all, all kinds of different climate uh, impacts and I feel like that really provides me with I guess what what Steve sort of also <laughs> saw in me this ability to try to connect global climate change uh, across different aspects not just Arctic sea ice um, to to what it means for for people and, and ecosystems around the world and that's really what I'm what I'm trying to bring to PBI uh, and I'm excited about this uh, collaboration going forward I'm sad to see Steve go but uh, Still overall excited. Thanks, Flavio. Thanks, John and Steve. Yes, Steve, we are very sad to see you go. And just yeah, listening to these two uh, talk, I'm I know that PBI's mission is in very, very good hands with their scientific background and all that you two have to offer. Um, amazing communicators. We're just really, really lucky to have you on the team. And I would love to, if anyone has any questions, I haven't seen anything in the Q&A, but if anyone watching has questions, please feel free to drop those in. But I have some questions that I would like to ask, and I assume that many watching are interested as well. And I, it's really a question for the three of you, but I might start with uh, hearing from uh, John and Flavio, and then Steve, maybe you can give us, you know, your big picture thought at the end, but wondering 
from your perspectives and your own seat of expertise, uh, what do you three really see as the primary priorities in Arctic and polar bear research as it relates to conservation over the next decade? John, do you want to start us out since give Flavio a break from chatting and then we can go to Flavio and then Steve? Sure thing, yeah. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the really interesting things that is becoming more and more clear um, over the last decade, uh, over the last 20 years, is um, the ice loss has accelerated and become pretty dramatic in some regions, um, is that we know uh, at a broad scale, um, polar bears and sea ice go together. You can't, you can't have polar bears without having sea ice. But we also have been coming to have this deeper and deeper appreciation for the heterogeneity of different subpopulations in terms of how they respond to their particular environment and their particular um, experience of ice loss. So we have some subpopulations of polar bears that right now are doing fine. They have experienced substantial ice loss, but they are doing fine. The Chukchi Sea comes to mind. Um, and I think it's really important to understand the, uh, and you know, this is my bias as a physiologist, but it's important to understand the organismal biology, the physiology behind that. And why is it that the ice retreat in one area um, is not changing the physiology of the polar bears? And, uh, you know, we know anecdotally some of what's driving some of these things, like in some parts of the Arctic, it's not just do you have sea ice? It's where is that sea ice? Is it over shallow productive water that has a lot of prey? If so, then the sea ice could be two degrees more north in terms of latitude than it was 50 years ago. Um, but if it's still over good habitat with lots of prey, then the bear's nutrition may not have changed at all. Um, so I think getting a better and better handle on the unique dynamics of each subpopulation um, is a really important uh, it's a really important avenue for uh, polar bear conservation to uh, head down. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. Flavio, do you have anything to add to the next decade for Arctic and polar bear conservation and research? Yeah, I would actually, I guess I would speak sort of from my vantage point of, of uh, uh, yeah, investigating climate change. Um, it's actually a perfect fit to, to what John said. So what we are spending a lot of time in climate science nowadays is trying to better understand the remaining uncertainties around these projections of future climate change, right? So I showed you before that there's a certain probability that Arctic sea ice um, will disappear um, in the future, but the prop this probability basically means that we don't know for certain when what is gonna happen. And this uncertainty is actually uh, quite a bit larger when you then zoom in to a particular region, like John said, certain subpopulations uh, of bears have, uh, they experience a particular ice, evol like evolution of Arctic sea ice over time. And so trying to resolve some of these remaining uh, uncertainties to be better able to say ice is going to disappear here in this decade or with this rate, uh, it's one of the core science um, challenges in my field, not just Arctic sea ice, but this is just where, where this particular example fits in nicely, trying to reduce these remaining uncertainties in the places that matter to inform uh, conservation research. So um, we're actually starting a project on, on exactly this question. And so it would really actually be an exciting opportunity to also work <laughs> with John uh, and others to do science and not just science communication, but I stop here, otherwise I get carried away. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Steve, do you have any uh, anything you would like to add? No, you know, I think uh, uh, this is really a great discussion because uh, it points out why it's going to be so valuable to have these two guys working for Polar Bears International. So I want to start out, uh, you know, that interface between what is likely to happen in different places with the sea ice and how that is likely to affect the bears there feeds right into management and policy uh, issues and decisions that uh, uh, various government agencies can make over the, uh, over the coming years. So uh, if we know more about how the ice changes in different areas will affect polar bears, and we know how the ice is likely to change there, 
then we can put dates on. Well, you know, if we just sit on our uh, thumbs and don't do anything, uh, we're going to lose our bears here by such and such a date. Maybe that is a spur for managers uh, and policymakers to say, well, wait a minute, we better get our act together and change this. So I think there's, I think there's real uh, immediate application for that. Um, you know, it's clear that if we don't do anything at all uh, with regard to global warming, we ultimately will lose polar bears. Uh, but we have a ways to go before we get to that point. And one of the things I always feel is important to emphasize is it's not too late to save polar bears. And the kinds of understandings that Flavio and John are building help us get the word out to the appropriate people that, okay, here's what we're gonna, here's what we're likely to lose. Here's what we might be able to save. Uh, you know, what are we gonna do about it? Yes, they. You definitely have a, a very nice synergy for, uh, for exactly what the polar bear conservation world really needs right now. So I'm excited to I'm excited to see you two work together and to and to work with you throughout this process. John, it looks like you're about to say something. Were you? Yeah, I, just to follow up briefly on what Steve just said, one of the ways that I look at PBI is that um, polar bears are just such a cool animal. They're so impressive. They're so charismatic. They're so broadly known. Um, and it's so known that they are intertwined with the sea ice habitat that there is a polar bear narrative in the public. You know, that's a given. Uh, so as long as it's out there, one of the ways that I look at PBI is it's a group that comes along and says, you know, as long as this narrative is out there, let's make it as accurate um, and as meaningful as possible. And so, uh, you know, being able to do something like uh, bringing in the science to say, okay, it's not just that polar bears rely on sea ice, it's that the sea ice is very unique in these regions and doing these different things. And here, polar bears rely on it for X here. It's a slightly different scenario because of the kind of habitat, so on and so forth. So it's a really it's a great opportunity to, um, to be able to redirect or, or to contribute to um, a conversation that's already, that, that's gonna be going on in the world. So we may as well make it as, uh, as accurate as possible. Yeah, you kind of uh, fed my next question, John, which was gonna be for, for you and Flavio and asking why, why it is that you have chosen uh, to to be a part of PBI in a more formal way. And John, you may have just answered that. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything you want to add or uh, Flavio, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, I would, you know, the only thing I would add is that uh, this last summer, um, when I first officially started working with PBI in this capacity, I think it was my very first day officially with PBI and I happened to be um, uh, doing a kind of an all staff meeting with just about everybody in person uh, in a major polar bear paper uh, representing a new advance in the science um, was about to be published, uh, not from anybody at PBI and I, I wasn't involved, this was a different research team, but all the media inquiries came out a couple of days before the publication um, asking for uh, input so all the journalists could write their stories and have them ready to release as soon as the paper came out because it was going to make a big media splash. Uh, and to it just really drove home to me that that is one of the key uh, benefits, one of the key strengths of this position in this organization is that, um, you know, this is PBI has made itself into kind of a clearinghouse for validating and disseminating the science behind the polar bear narrative. And so by putting myself into that organization, I get to be somebody who's contributing to that. So that's one of the, one of the main things that um, I'm, I'm excited to get out of this. Yeah, I can, I can only sort of echo what, what John said and uh, emphasize this aspect of the credibility and the accuracy with which PBI works. Uh, it was always like important for them to work with scientists to get the science right. Uh, they're doing their own research. We are doing our own research as we just talked about. Um, that makes it a relatively unique uh, sort of nonprofit working in conservation space. There's a lots of lots of them, but not, uh, not any, yeah, any one of them has this kind of impact uh, through, through working with scientists and, and doing their own research. So. Uh, yeah, it's just an incredibly uh, well-run uh, conservation 
group. And then it's also a fun group of people. Uh, like everybody who works with PBI, just as John said, uh, really wants to do that. It's not, uh, it's not a day job. We've done it uh, in a volunteering sense and we're happy to do it in a formal sense. Um, so that's, that makes working with everybody here really uh, also fun. Good. I'm happy to hear, happy to hear you're having fun in your first couple weeks or month of working with us. That's, that is an important part for sure. Uh, Cause it's, you know, it's intense work. So uh, we have to have joy in working with each other for sure. I do have a technical question that came in. That's a little bit less of um, that will be kind of fun. Cause I think you each will have a different answer. So what months does polar bear field research take place or, you know, what months does your research take place? Do you want to start out, Flavio, and then we can move to John and Steve? Sure. I mean, uh, I would say, like, since I don't do a lot of field research, uh, I, I kind of don't have a specific research season. But obviously, the, the the limited time we have in Churchill is always a great opportunity to, um, it's like, yeah, test theories, talk to people, come together uh and, and like go over the latest polar bear research combine it with climate science research so uh as you said it's always an intense uh i didn't mean to say working with pbi fun in a like vacation kind of sense it's always extremely yeah. intense uh but um like in a good way and and so that's usually i i the, these these like week-long uh sessions we have whenever we get together are really uh kind of the core Part for me to connect my science to to conservation. Other than that, I work on science the rest of the year. Uh, we have a lot of data to go through that isn't necessarily tied to a particular field season. So yeah, it's a 365 days a year kind of thing. No rest for you. <laughs> uh, John, how about you? When is uh, when does polar bear research generally take place for you? Or when has it? Um, I would say uh, one thing about that is in order to get a hold, polar bears are really hard to get a hold of. So <laughs> just about the only uh, feasible way to do captures is helicopter based. And because they spend most of their time on the sea ice, the kind of classic season um, in which you have a combination of enough daylight, uh, warm enough temperatures and solid and uh, uh, a solid large extent of sea ice in which to safely work on top of is in spring. Um, and so, uh, you know, late March through early May or so is when I would say probably the vast majority of polar bear captures happen. Um, I will say there's an increasing effort to do, it seems to me that lately there's been a little bit more effort to do captures um, in uh, autumn as well, uh, August and September in some places where they traditionally haven't been done in the past, which is adding some very important new knowledge. Um, there are a couple places in the Arctic. Western Hudson Bay is a place that is a very well studied polar bear population. And they're unique there because all the sea ice melts every summer, all the bears are forced to come ashore and they hang out in a relatively small area. So August and September is actually a pretty common time of year for captures to happen there. And, you know, one more thing I'd say with that is I, uh, I need, I, I need, I want tissue samples <laughs> for a lot of what I do. You know, it's hard to do physiology from afar. And so having some kind of a sample can tell you so much. And it's pretty common to take blood samples from polar bears as long as you've, you've gone through the work to do the capture. And so one of the best things that you can do is working with larger groups of people who have all taken different samples for different regions or for different reasons, perhaps in different areas. And then you can end up with a whole large data set um, that would simply be too difficult to try and collect yourself. Uh, so Steve, anything else? Well, I guess I would add some uh, some uh, temporal context. Uh, you know, when I first started polar bear research in Alaska, I looked at what others had tried to do in the past, and it was all focused on spring work. But in those days, we also could work in Alaska in the fall on the sea ice. And so for a number of years, we did uh, a couple of months in the field in the spring, and then about six weeks in the fall before the sunset for the winter. And that gave us two uh, sort of opposite ends of the year view of what was going on with the bears. Unfortunately, with global warming, uh, we now don't have adequate sea ice in the fall to get out and work with bears on the sea ice. And so you, you mentioned, John, that uh, there is a, 
uh, recent push to try and capture bears on land in the summertime in Alaska and some other places. But it used to be we could work in the fall as well. And we caught hundreds of bears in the fall in those early years. Uh, but climate has changed and that's no longer possible. And in fact, talking to the people who have been continuing to work on polar bears in Alaska since I left, uh, they're finding it harder and harder to get uh, to have safe sea ice that they can work on even in the spring. So the challenge of getting the kinds of samples that you uh, need for your research is becoming ever greater. Uh, and uh, that's, I guess that's just one added thing I would uh, would comment about that uh, we are seeing changes in all of these things that uh, uh, in many cases complicate the work we're trying to do. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a great addition. And uh, we have one more quick question that I will let you all uh, to select who's going to answer it. But we have someone asking if polar bears in Labrador are ever studied. Anyone? <laughs> or off of? <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, there have been some studies of polar bears uh, in the, the Labrador area. Uh, that's part of uh, probably what would be called the Davis Strait uh, population. And it is part of the seasonal ice ecoregion where uh, the sea ice melts entirely in the summertime. All the bears are forced ashore. The amount of research that has been done there has been relatively small compared to many other parts of the Arctic. Um, but uh, there has been some work done. And one of the interesting things about polar bears in that region is uh, we have seen some changes in their food habits based on changes in prey availability. If you look at uh, uh, polar bears globally, uh, ring seals are between 80 and 90, 95% of their diet. Uh, but in the Davis Strait area, there's been uh, uh, the ice has changed enough that it's no longer ideal for ring seal habitat, but it's better for gray seals and harp seals. And so those alternate species have become, for some bears at least, an important uh, an important prey element. And so we expect to see some things like this that uh, uh, will go forward, and and people will be asking. Oh, well, if polar bears can eat that, uh, maybe they're going to be okay. And, uh, you know, John actually has been looking at the topic of polar bears taking advantage of uh, the remains of bowhead whales that are harvested by Alaskan native hunters along Alaska's North Slope and the degree to which those may be valuable for the bears up there. These are all parts of the puzzle that uh, we're uh, facing right now of uh, uh, what the global future of polar bears looks like. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I think I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing that this has been an amazing conversation and we have taken the full hour, which is really awesome. It just showcases how much there, there is to explore here. And we're just scratching uh, the surface of, I think the stories and, and things we'll learn from Flavio and John and uh, definitely won't be the last time that we're with Steve, but we're, we're grateful for all of the work that you've done and um, also excited for you to enjoy a little bit of the world, as you said. So I will, I might hand it over to Krista for final uh, parting words. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna let everyone know we will email out a link of this uh, conversation so you can rewatch it. And we'll also include uh, an attachment with all of the visuals spoken about today. So thank you very much, Krista. Do you wanna close this out? Thanks, Emily. And yeah, thanks to all of you for sharing this hour with us. Um, as you can see why we are very excited to add both John and Flavio to our team along with Amy. So I think there will be some, you know, new and exciting things to come for the future of Polar Bears International. We're excited. We do get to spend at least one more field season with uh, Steve in Churchill this fall. We we told him he has an open invitation, but he will be joining us this fall. And I just want every to remind everyone um, to tune in. Um, we'll be we'll be 
posting information in the upcoming weeks about our schedule this fall in Churchill. And Polar Bear Week is the first week of November. And remember that talking about climate change and voting for the climate are two things that you can do. We have, some of us have upcoming elections and we encourage you to get out and vote with polar bears in mind. And yes, thanks everyone for your time and to Steve especially. It's been a remarkable 12 years working with you and I know we will stay in touch and we're really looking forward to um, the future with John Flavio and Amy, along with the other outstanding team members at PBI. So thanks everyone for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good evening.